Hello everyone, glad to see you on my channel. Today we will listen to the memoirs of Ramon Diestro, Spanish commander of the Grenade Launcher Battalion of the Central Front. Subscribe to my channel and leave comments whose memoirs you would like to hear. F. Rom Felice Lucandi, I learned for the first time that it is possible not to be able to walk at the age of 22. You don't know where the right side is or what a closed row is. He shouts at his 200 men, patiently marching with them from morning till evening. The 4th Battalion, part of Mangada's column, stood at Nevalparal, 70 kilometres from Madrid. The Republic had no army then, and its fighters were armed with rifles of the most incredible systems. We wore colourful costumes, not one like the other. 200 young fighters metal workers from Madrid factories, students and completely illiterate peasants from Extremadura, of whom almost none could write their own name, made up the battalion. We knew almost nothing about our commander. We only knew that he was a communist and a steelworker from the capital of the Basque country, and that he would soon be 40. While awaiting our arrival in Nevalparal Lucandi, had settled in a small abandoned house. We were later told that Felice Lucandi had arrived to form a new unit with his own weapons. It was a rather museum-like rifle for our days, which Lucandi had buried twice in the ground. Comrade Captain, we asked him once, why do you need this staff? Felice Lucandi listened to us and answered with a bit of cheer. Friends, my gun is not for fighting. It has witnessed two battles with the counter-revolution. After our defeats, running away from the police, I hid it twice in the ground. And now I've given my word not to bury it again. This rifle is brought to Nevalparal to shake off forever the earth in which it has lain, and to see victory at last. Perhaps to my Soviet friends the captain's words might seem inspired by some romance, but we, a bit of a romantic ourselves, understood him. After hearing the story of the captain's rifle, Delbel winked at me. The case was familiar to us. After all, we too, having dismantled a hand machine gun one night, buried it outside the city. That was in December 1934. Sixteen days in a row, together with Luis, we arrived at exactly 11 o'clock in the evening by car to the Madrid prison and waited. We waited for Francisco Ordanez who had escaped from his cell, to quickly jump into the car. We were not afraid of the chase we had a machine gun with us in the car. Nineteen-year-old Ordondans had been imprisoned for his involvement in the Asturian Rebellion. He was caught with a transport of weapons that he was smuggling to rebellious miners. The prosecutor demanded at his trial fourteen years hard labour for our brave friend, and we decided to break him out of prison. But our plans were thwarted, Convinced that we couldn't help Ordonnens, we decided to bury the machine gun. Remember? Louis squinted at me. Our commander was full of some marvellous energy that infected each of us. Well, now you can distinguish the right side from the left and out of five bullets one will probably hit the target, Lucandi once told us. We realised that the days of training were over and soon we would have to go to the front. That day the commander made a speech about Spanish sentimentality. Maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow we will meet some of our compatriots who are fighting for fascism. Let all fighters realise that we must spare none of them in battle. These compatriots are now our mortal enemies. All our thoughts and actions should be directed to one thing to achieve victory over fascism concluded our commander. We swear Lucandi not to spare our enemies, and he jokingly demands. Louder, because you know my old ears can't hear very well. Yes, we know that and even affectionately call the captain our grouse. Lucandi was not only an excellent commander, but also a staunch, consistent Marxist. He, from the first days of the fascist rebellion, began to dream of creating a regular republican army and in the evenings in his cabin, which was called in our Cathedral of Marxism, we listened to passionate speeches on this and many other topics. One day we demanded, Commander, how soon shall we leave this roof and go into battle? Tell us about yourself. 
We didn't learn much that night. Lucandi was stingy with words. For 21 years he has been involved in the labour movement. When he was 18, he left home, telling his mother, I'm going to get matches, and left, never to return to his home again. For several days now, our observation post has been five kilometres from Navalparal. It consists of five men. Commanded by Torres, the best sports journalist in Spain, a sports expert and a sportsman himself. And now the whole battalion is on the front lines. In the morning at our trenches lay numerous leaflets dropped from fascist planes. If you do not leave here, we will destroy you and evening. Lucandi read the leaflet aloud and said, Such an evening will never come if we do not forget what we learned in Nivalparal. An hour later, the black Tors, who had been sitting as an observer all these days, reported the appearance of the fascist cavalry. And indeed, soon in a kilometre from us we saw it. Often, being already a commander myself, I repeated the demanding and formidable words of Captain Lucandi, addressed at that moment to us. Do not fire until you hear my order. Here I must speak of one of our comrades who remained at Navalparalo. It was Salinas, the commander of our only cannon. Salinas was famous for the fact that not a single shell of his wasted for firing he hit the enemy from the first shot. Anyone who understands anything about artillery will understand how hard it was to achieve such accuracy. With the student Salinas, who then had the rank of lieutenant, worked extraordinary gun crew. They were all professors of the mathematics department. They formed under the direction of Salinas something like an artillery concilium, made complex calculations and, themselves frightened of each shot, continued to work and calculate. Hold your fire. We heard again the threatening warning of Captain Lucandi. We were perplexed. How could we not fire when at least two cavalry regiments of the enemy were rushing at us? But Lucandi remembered the skill of the gun commander Salinas, invisible to us from here. When the cavalry was already 300 metres away from us, we suddenly saw how riders and horses began to fly into the air, how they were mowed down by shrapnel, and how terror gripped the surviving cavalrymen. Then Lucandi commanded, Fire, friends. Yes, it's not a hard thing, war cries the throaty pancha video and he gleefully informs us what we see for ourselves, stretching our necks out from behind the covers and covering the clearing with a fleeting glance. The squadrons that came last turn swiftly and haphazardly, but they too are overtaken by the apt Salinas. We send a volley of rifle fire after them, and the joker Pancha video quips. Let us see who flies faster, your horses or my bullet. This was the first firing we have done in an organised, commanded manner in this war. We are preparing for our first night in the trenches. No, Panchavideo is exaggerating after all. War is not such an easy thing. Little gaffos can't imagine sleeping on the ground with just a blanket. Comrade Commander Gaffos stretches himself out before Lucandi with an excessive tautness. You promised to return the mule to the peasant in Nawalparala. Shall I not do so now? The captain hides a smile, he understands the young fighter's uncomplicated strategy. I promised, but not today, but only in three days, when we will be replaced and returned to Nevalparal. Dot, 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 dusk is slowly approaching. The mountains sink in the distance. What silence. Do you hear that? Torres calls for silence. Behind our rock shelters it becomes silent, we all freeze and gaze across the clearing. Ahead, about two kilometres from the trenches, the forest begins. We all hear long, muffled screams coming from behind the forest. Only our grouse does not hear them, but he is the first to recognise the slowly approaching mass of people. Moors, says Lucandi calmly. We are stunned by this news. We clutch our rifles tighter, and Lucandi smiles and shouts with unwavering equanimity. Now the 4th Battalion will show the more. These were the first Moroccans seen on Spanish soil by the fighters of the Republic. They marched, rifles in hand, 
a vast, endless mass with a kind of wild noise. But why was Salinas silent? Where were his mathematicians? Delbol was shouting excitedly on the telephone. Why aren't you shooting? Salinas angrily replied. What do you want to shoot with? Stones. There's not a single shell left. The close ranks of the Moroccans were already so close to us that we recognised sounds that seemed incomprehensible to us at a great distance. It was neither song nor war cry, but laughter. The wild sight shocked us. The Moroccans were marching without firing. They were laughing. Lucandi gave orders to Thors, Luis Delbol and another machine gunner. Fire, friends. And in response to that command, a torrential lead rain fell. Never did the machine gunners have a better target than this moving column of Moroccans. We felt a hot dryness in our throats. Fire, friends. It's already Lucandi calling us to join the fight. We see the Moroccans falling. They all seem to us similar to each other, the bared white teeth, the fierce faces of the maddened enemy. They fall more and more often, and the laughter dies down. One of the men of the battalion shouts out loudly, Long live the Republic. Dot, 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 the terrible run of the enemy is stopped by the men of the 4th Battalion, who have entered their first day of war. The field is strewn with the corpses of mercenaries, after the battle we learned the reasons for this march of the Moroccans into battle, their mad laughter and total disregard for us. The Moroccans taken prisoner told us that before the attack they had been told that the Reds had nothing but sticks and a few hunting rifles. The dot 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 thaws ran from one machine gun to another. No one had such an accurate eye and could so accurately determine the distance to the target as he did. I was lying next to his machine gun. From a distance we saw a second column of Moroccans. It moved without song or laughter. The Moors were walking, scattered across the field, huddled on the ground. It seemed to me I heard the voice of Thors that Delbol's machine gun was silent during the last firing. And Tors suddenly suggested. Let's give them some ribbons, maybe Luis is out of ammunition. If they tell you that in the first battle they have no fear, do not believe it. Torres suggested that I follow him to Delbol's machine gun, 200 metres away. This meant that I had to walk a distance where death awaited me at every step. Whether I could get up is what I'm thinking about at this moment. There are thousands of bullets whizzing over our heads, and only cover will save us. What did you say? I asked Torres again. Pull it, he says to me, completely indifferent. Get that box. Delbad is silent for some reason. And Tors gets up and walks calmly to Delbol's machine gun. I follow him without a word. This is how ignominiously my life will end. This is where Raman Diestro must die. What does Thors care about Delbol's machine gun? Why did he think Lewis's machine gun was silent? I am drawn to the ground, I am ready to cling to it, but Torres, as if to spite me, turns around. Then I decide to take it as it comes and walk with the wide gate of black Torres. And still I bend down, assuring myself that it is not from cowardice, but from the weight of the box. Two hundred metres. How long we've been walking towards Delbel's machine gun. Why aren't you firing? Black Torres shouts cheerfully to Delbel. Maybe there is no ammunition, so we bring. Suddenly Thors falls silent. He flinches and slowly falls down. The bullet hit him in the temple. It was the first death, the first loss in our battalion. Returning, I ran now without bending. Having made my way to the grouse, I whispered in his ear. Comrade Captain, Torres has been killed. Torres? The captain asks in a fallen voice and takes my hand. Yes, I nod. Lucandi turns away, and I see how the stern man who denounced the day before yesterday in a special speech sentimentality, crying. A few seconds later, Felice Lucandi has already given the command, always pronounced by him in a chant. 
fire, friends. Now he gave the command with redoubled fury. The Moroccans were about 200 meters away. They came at us with a terrible shout. Cowardly Mussolini's praised soldier. The German is also a coward, not much braver than his Italian counterpart. Compared to them, only the Moroccan is brave, abundantly pouring blood on a country unknown to him. At first he was very terrible to us, this new foreign enemy, who despised death to no end. Then the Moors ceased to be a bogeyman. We learned to defeat them too. I do not believe that the Moor is not afraid of anything, said once Lucandi. There are no such brave men. All were cowards, and only those who overcame cowardice are brave. Here we are with you, concluded, laughing the captain, now brave. But what is to say we were cowards, like everyone else? The 4th Battalion was already repulsing the 5th Moroccan attack. You see, joked Felice Lucandi, you see how metal workers, peasants and students make generals change tactics. Yes, we've seen it. The invincible Moroccan cavalry, which was threatening to tread the pavement of Madrid, suddenly changed its profession. After our first blow, the cavalrymen became infantrymen. Having dismounted from their horses, they did not quite feel well on this land under our fire. For the second day there was fighting behind Nevalperol. We did not retreat a single step. Mangada's column in those days covered itself with unfading glory. The soldiers received greetings and congratulations from the workers of the capital. Salinas, our artilleryman, was already with us in the trenches. From the cannon he had switched to the machine gun, as our battalion's small supply of shells had long since melted away. The mortar was also silent for the same reason. We repelled the Moroccans' attacks with only rifles, three machine guns, bayonets and grenades. Hundreds of Moroccan soldiers' corpses lie in front of our trenches. The wind carries the unbearable odour of decay. Dead, they seem even more enormous. Little Gafos cringes. They had to travel so far for death. Hope suddenly flashes in his eyes. Maybe the living will see their comrades through, and they will want to go home. But thousands more Moroccans were on the attack. We saw them leaping over the bodies of their dead comrades as if they were natural obstacles lying in their path. During these days of continuous attacks, none of us slept. It was the third day without sleep or food. It was a moonless night. To us young fighters, it seemed that to the trenches from all sides crawled Moroccans. Since the evening, Lucandi had been cheering us up. This is the last night. After this night, he promised us a counterattack, the capture of Avila, rich trophies, promised a battery Salinas, dozens of machine guns Del Balu. Do not sleep, passing through the trenches, with paternal tenderness, he said. At three o'clock in the morning, the attack resumed. We fired indiscriminately, not seeing the enemy and guessing him only by long and clumsy shadows. And as he approached our trenches, we heard Lucandi's loud voice. On the wings, friends. We had no experience of hand-to-hand -hand combat yet, but we swiftly, leaping out of our trenches and, as one, rushing towards the enemy. A song. Demands the captain and we respond with the fiery words of the red banner which make our hearts pound even harder and quicken our step. We rush on with bayonets and song, and seem to repel the moors in an instant. The 4th Battalion is positioned at the new shelters, 500 metres ahead of the old trenches. The Moroccans are close behind us. They take cover behind rocks and barricaded by the corpses of their comrades. No one fires. We, like the enemy, wait patiently for dawn. But about five o'clock we decide to try what the enemy has done many times to go on the offensive. This was our first counterattack. The Moroccans did not expect it. Ruthless in our crushing and unique throw, we rushed to the enemy's barricades and pelted them with grenades. In one breath we run the distance separating us from the moors, and in a few minutes lie behind new shelters. Not a single shot had been fired all day. There was complete silence all around. 
We were so exhausted that even the sound of voices tired us. Lucandi allowed us to sleep. Tucked into our blankets, we lay down behind the rocks, guarded by sharp-eyed sentries. After sleep, the men cleaned themselves up, distributed the food found in the Moroccan's leather bags, sent the wounded to Nevalperal, counted the small trophies, and replenished the ammunition supply. At eight o'clock in the evening, when it was getting dusk, several Moroccans appeared from behind a hillside 500 metres from us. They stood with their arms raised high. They had no weapons of any kind. We did not fire. The Moors walked slowly in our direction without lowering their arms, and when one of us shouted a greeting to them for they were defectors, they turned around and called out to someone. Soon two hundred men joined them. It was a joyous sight. The Moroccans marched with their hands up and, cursing the Spanish language, shouted, Brothers, we are the Reds. The 4th Battalion cheered. The soldiers came out from behind their hiding places, threw their hats up and shouted, Come to us, brothers. We were ready to rush towards them and embrace them, our deceived enemies, who had already killed dozens of our comrades. With tanned bronze faces, the tall Moroccans walked smiling. They were already close to us, when suddenly an incomprehensible and terrible force fell on the 4th Battalion. Grenades were bursting all around. In the hands of 200 people who called us brothers, there were small hand grenades, which were difficult to notice even at a distance of 30 metres. And so the grenades flew at us. The ground is failing under my feet. I gulped greedily for air. Short and sharp bursts of explosions blind my eyes and burn my body. I hear grenades exploding, the groans of the dying and the furious curses of the living fighters. Stunned by this unexpected treachery, we rush for cover. The fierce voice of Felice Lucandi brings back our courage. No more shall escape. This cry overrides all. Follow me. Only now it becomes clear to us, the survivors, that the insidious enemy has miscalculated. We rush after the grouse without firing a shot. In the smoke screen, still not melted after the explosions, our bayonets and butts quickly find the enemy. Where did the men of the 4th Battalion get their strength from? As if there were not three sleepless nights. Lucandi kept shouting. Not one of them will leave. We answered. Not one. All 200 Moors lay in our trenches. But the new enemy, who was somewhere not far from the battlefield, could at any moment fall on us. Lucandi was ahead of the enemy. Half a kilometre away from us, Salinas and Delbo were already setting up their machine guns. This time the enemy did not risk another attack. Leaving the guard, in an hour we left the field strewn with the corpses of the Moors. We are marching towards Avila. From the flanks we are supported by parts of the October Regiment. Without meeting a single fascist, we freely approaching the neighbourhood of Avavila. We can already see this small town once inhabited by 25,000 people. Intelligence reported that Avila left fascist units and Lucandi determined the exact time of our entry into the town. There's exactly one cigarette left to smoke. I, along with a reconnaissance patrol, enter the suburbs of Avila. We are overtaken by a horseman wearing a wide-brimmed Mexican hat over a black kerchief tied low on his forehead. I recognize Colonel Gonzalez of Mangada's headquarters. Without getting off his horse, he asked which of us was in charge, and hearing my name, handed over a written order. Turn with the patrol and hand the packet to Captain Lucandi immediately. The battalion was a kilometer behind us. Why couldn't the colonel himself pass on the order to our commander? Since he had galloped over from there, this thought did not leave me as I ran with the packet. In a few minutes I was standing before the captain. Perplexed, he read the order and handed it to me. On a piece of paper it was written in small slanting letters, leave Avila immediately and return to Navalperal. No explanation. We returned in silence, overwhelmed by the incomprehensible mechanics of war. After all, it was only one cigarette to Avila, as the captain put it, 
and from here we could start to really chase the enemy. Lucandi understood perfectly well the meaningful silence of his men. At a short halt where we counted our spoils, abandoned by the enemy at the gates of Avila, there were four guns, six machine guns, 130 horses, seven trucks and 500 sets of uniforms, Felice Lucandi made the shortest of his speeches. Friends, orders are not negotiable. Then Panchavidio asked, raising his hand. Permission, comrade captain. Lucandi silently nodded his head in agreement. We were walking when we were shot at, began Pancho, and suddenly we stop, when not a single rifle is not aimed at the battalion. It is incomprehensible, comrade captain. Orders are not negotiable, Lucandi repeated sternly, and added conciliatingly the command is afraid that we will get too far ahead and suffer unnecessary losses. We were approaching the sites of the recent fighting. It was night. Everyone was silent. For some reason I kept flashing before my eyes the wide Mexican hat, the colonel's black handkerchief, and his small and slanting handwriting. I was sure the captain was thinking the same thing. The order to retreat was too obscure. We entered Nevalparal in the daylight. There was an order from the war ministry waiting for us. For the victory over the Moroccans, the first foreign troops that the fighters of the Republic met in these days, our 4th Battalion was given three days rest in Madrid and a cash bonus of 200 pesetas each. In addition, three men of the battalion received the rank of sergeant. I was among them. The last night before leaving for the capital, I spent in the Cathedral of Marxism Lucandi's house. He showed me a portrait of his mother and read her letters. I went out to get matches and haven't seen my mother since. Twenty-odd years passed and Lucandi suddenly declares I'll go to visit the old lady. We talked that night about many things the need to organise loud readings, about Madrid, which for the first time will see our fighters the peasants of Extremadura, the use of the library Nivelperal priest, and the distribution among the peasants of local villages horses captured from Avila. What do you think of Gonzalez's order? I asked Lucandi. Tell me the truth. I think nothing, Lucandi replied evasively. But if you want to know the truth, let it remain between us. I do not like Gonzales. In the morning on trucks, repulsed from the enemy, with captured Moroccans, we entered the capital. We were welcomed in a solemn manner. The extreme adurans were lost in the noisy streets of Madrid, and I was their escort, as Lucandi, who had remained in Nevalparal, had asked me. I showed the peasants the Madrid subway and these shelled fighters who were not afraid of shells, bullets or the frantic attacks of the Moroccans here suddenly became frightened and said in chorus, this is the underworld. Madrid in those days was still carefree and cheerful. In the cafes were a lot of people, in theatres were merry operettas, in cabarets danced. One of the Estremadurans who resented all this more than the rest of the fighters said to me glumly. We must counterattack this fun, it is more dangerous than the moors. We were quartered in the barracks. In the evening I reported home in full armour, and embracing my mother and sisters, cheerfully reported. Sergeant Diestro has arrived at your disposal for three days. We were leaving Madrid, which had welcomed us so hospitably. Lucandi will be amazed when he sees his men in their new uniforms real regulars. The extreme adurans clatter, with nailed soles they like the iron clang of good boots. After a three-day vacation we were outnumbered. In Nivalpril with the 4th Battalion from the capital goes a new replenishment. My platoon leader, Lieutenant Louis Delbol, has six new recruits. First among them is Francisco Urena. To tell you the truth, we had a long discussion with Del Bull when our friend came to us and declared himself a volunteer. I'll go with you wherever you go. He threatened the enemy, promised to deal with the entire fascist army and mysteriously reported that they prepared such a pill that the enemy will aghast. After listening to all the threats of Francisco to the enemy, which our school friend has never seen, 
Delbo makes an unexpected discovery. You're a braggart, Popeye. We laugh. At last Francisco's nickname is found. Popeye's is what we'll call him. We can't think of anything better. Popeye is the name of a character in American adventure movies. He too is always threatening the enemy, waving his fists. He rarely carries out his threats. Popeye's, you do not take offence. Because we are your old friends, we try to prepare our comrade, but you should not go to the front. Francisco is sincerely perplexed. Why? Only then we notice that Urena is dressed in his travelling clothes. He's wearing some fantastic red leather pants, he calls them armoured pants, windbreakers and huge boots that don't fit his height. Remember, Popeye, as you were afraid of the ball on the field, and there is something more dangerous than soccer waiting for you. Francisco confesses embarrassed. True, I was afraid, but it was psychology, not cowardice. We confer with Delbull and decide that. We'll take you to our captain and he'll decide. We reassure the happy Francisco. In the six more of our friends, Julian Palacios, a famous track and field athlete, Diego de Mesa, the son of the famous Spanish poet Enrique Mesa, Alberto, my brother, Jose Castanedo, a university friend, and Julio Romeo, a medical student. There could have been more newcomers. A whole regiment of volunteers was ready to follow us to Nivalparal, but we were very careful in selecting candidates for the battalion. That was the agreement with Captain Felice Lucandi. We must have such a unit that every soldier, going into battle, knew that no one would betray him. That was Lucandi's instruction. And we have not failed our commander, all six new fighters, true Republicans, members of the United Union of Socialist Youth, a great cultural force, especially necessary in a unit where half of the fighters peasants. My brother, a Marxist and a good orator, was appointed agitator of the battalion. Diego de Mesa was entrusted with a large group of fighters who could not read and write. The lectures on sanitation and hygiene were given by Julia Romeo. The library of the Nivalparal priest and all the newspapers came under the charge of Francisco. Finally nicknamed Pepe, he became our reader and front book bearer. The first 15 days after our vacation we spent comparatively quietly. The wooded hills in which our lodges are situated are perfumed with the wonderful fragrance of autumn. We are scarcely disturbed by the enemy, and we are on company duty four days in the front lines and three days resting at Nivalparal. Sometimes at night, when the whole battalion was asleep, a light flare would suddenly fly over the peasant houses turned into barracks. The liaison officers rushed to the telephones, but in vain they clutched the tubes of the field apparatuses no one answered. Searching in the darkness of the line, the communicators found a wire cut by someone's traitorous hand. We rushed to the place where unknown signalers were lying, sending conditional missiles to the enemy, but we could not find anyone. The waiting for the order to attack seemed endless to us. On the 16th day of our stay in Nevalparal, the 4th Battalion was finally given the long-awaited order. We were to make a surprise attack on a moonless night to take the town of Las Navas, situated high in the mountains, by the swift and cold streams. It is an old and well-known resort. Here, hiding from the summer heat, rested Madrid's bourgeoisie, here in windless and mild winters wandered on skis rich tourists. Lucandi laughed. Here we are going to visit the resort. Las Navas is a strategically advantageous height, a natural stronghold of Nivalparal. The scouts are back. We now have accurate data, where the enemy trenches and where his barriers. The command even knows, and all thanks to intelligence, what is done in the rear of the enemy. Information obtained by intelligence, and the decision taken on the suddenness of the attack inspire in the soldiers strong confidence in the success, although we have a small combat reserves. The task is clear. The attack is scheduled for three o'clock in the morning. Las Navas is eight kilometres away. We form a platoon and disappear into the darkness. The command is whispered, almost at Las Navas itself, when the guard of the careless enemy was already removed, 
suddenly came an alarming telegram. Republic loses Pegrinos. This news was reported from headquarters. Pegrinpos, a small village, is suddenly occupied by the Moroccans. It must be recaptured at all costs. We are again at a loss. For the second time we're stopped at our objective. We will not reach Pegrinos until morning, so the battle will no longer be sudden. Lucandi grows gloomy. The men realise the difficulty of the task and are nervous. After all, we have so little ammunition, only one clip each. If we could move on Las Navas with this ammunition, expecting to take the sleepy enemy by surprise in a surprise night attack, it would be madness to attack Pegrinos in the daytime with five rounds. The men whisper unequivocally about the fifth cartridge, which must be saved in order not to fall alive into the hands of the Moroccans. Lukandi gathers together a force of twenty men. Here are the commanders and the most seasoned and brave fighters. We will take Pegrinos, Lukandi began icily. Even with five bullets we'll take it. And the captain cautions only on one condition the fighters must be sure that they have a few extra magazines in their bag. What a fantasy Lukandi had in mind. We look at each other in silence. The captain is silent as well. A few minutes later, at a brief rally, our marvellous commander gives a pep talk. Friends, we need to take Pegrinos from the moors. We are well rested and well armed. Yes, yes, repeated the captain, very, very well armed, and he pointed in the direction from which we came. Behind us comes a wagon with a good hundred thousand rounds of ammunition. There was not a man in the 4th Battalion who could not believe Lucandi. If Lucandi says it's true, it's true. We set off briskly, trying to see the unfamiliar terrain in the pale rays of dawn. Pegrinos lies in a hollow. The day will come when historians will come here. They will record all the eyewitness accounts and participants in this first great battle that gave victory to the Republic. Having broken into the village, the enemy mocked the defenceless population, raped, robbed, drank, forgetting all precautions. We approached Pegrinos when the Moors were still celebrating their entry into the village. The battalion of the October Regiment approached from the right, and we advanced on the left side to the point of impact. On this day the fighters of the Republic felt, finally, the full force of the interaction between infantry and aviation and saw the destructive work of our attack planes, swept shaving flight. Fast-winged, they murmured their engines broke the silence of the autumn morning. We rushed into the village and caught the beginning of the panic flight of the Moors, immediately sobered by the steel raid of our aircraft. But there was nowhere to run. All possible exits from the village are occupied by the men of our battalions. Almost without firing a shot, without discharging even a single clip, we quickly run into Pegrinos, as if we wanted to catch up with our pilots, who had just fled at a terrible speed. He who strikes first can always expect to win. It was the shortest and most successful battle in which I had to take part in all the months of the war. We were bayoneting our way through the narrow streets of the village. The Moors, offering no resistance, raised their trembling hands in the air. They did not shout brothers like two hundred of their countrymen on the memorable evening, but only begged for life. An hour later, with a reconnaissance, I was going forward. With me were two fighters and the battalion merrymaker Panchavidio. We headed for one of the heights where we were to stay until the shift came. We had almost no information about the enemy's position, and it seemed to us that the events at Petrinosa, because of their lightning speed, were not yet known to the enemy. Soon our guesses were confirmed. Through binoculars we saw a man descending rapidly down the mountain towards the Pegrinos Valley. We could not yet tell from the shape of the man who it was coming towards us. In the early months of the war, both the rebel troops and our units wore almost the same uniform overalls, and on hot days we were all without hats. Beside me lay Panchavidio and a senior soldier of the rank of Cabo. Phalangist the Cabo whispers confidently. We freeze in place. A few minutes of patience will make up for our long wait. Here we already hear the cheerful singing of a man coming down the mountain. 
He is in military uniform, you can see it even without binoculars. He is wearing the same new overalls as we are. Our cabo, very neat and even dapper, rises to his full height. The singing military man is about a hundred meters away from us. At the sight of the cabo, he is even more cheerful. The officer solemnly proclaims, raising his hand in greeting. Arriva Espana. We continue to lie down, hearing the fascist greeting of the officer, who mistook our cabo for a rebel soldier, we were ready to jump out from behind the hillside, as suddenly there was a response and the same solemn. Arriva Espana. Our cabo does not want to disappoint the fascist yet. Let him come closer for a handshake. In a minute the officer's boots appear near our hiding place. Stretch out punch a video or I a hand, and it is not difficult to reach the officer. But we lie so quietly that we can hear the beating of our hearts. How far are the pigs? inquires the officer. He's the one who's wondering about us Republicans. And then we hear a heavy thump, the fall of a body, and the ironic report of a caboose. One of these pigs greets you, Sidnor. We run out of cover, look at the officer and politely suggest that he get up. Then we help him remove his weapon and explain with emphasised courtesy that he is lost. Isn't that Pegrinos, the officer asks, puzzled. That's right, Pegrinos, we reply in unionison. But since some time there are already grazing pigs. Our reconnaissance was lucky. A few hours later we were enriched with a new but even more significant trophy. We divided the whole area into sectors for observation. I got the top of one mountain and a steep rise. I don't lower my binoculars. Suddenly some figure grew in the magnifying glasses. I nod to punch a video, he sees the same thing. Let's go, we decide. Or perhaps there is an enemy sitting close by, and he has deliberately released this bait on the mountainside. Still, we decide to go forward. Through binoculars we can see how, looking around, a man is walking. Here he stops. We sneak along, well camouflaged. It's not hard to see the stranger, or rather, a stranger. Yes, it's a woman. She often sits down to rest. We crawl silently. Damn it. She's the pharmacist at the pharmacy in Nevalperia. Admittedly, we used to frequent that establishment, not so much for medicines as to gawk at the only girl left from the days of fighting in Nevalperol. But what is she doing here? so far away from her vials and prescriptions. We crawl on. The naval parole pharmacy girl has good hearing. She heard a suspicious rustle and jumped up. We point our rifles at the pharmacist just in case and order her to get down on the ground. What are you doing here? The interrogation is whispered, collecting herbs. What kind of scientific excursions are these? We suggest that the researcher of Guadarrama's green cover crawl ahead of us. The girl is nervous, but we reassure her that it's still easier than climbing the heights. Then we climb up, politely search our old acquaintance, and find a plan of our cantonment at Nevalperol, the location of the forward trenches, and a note addressed to the rebel headquarters. This is not refined Latin at all. Pancho Video admonishes, running over the note and it is not signed not by a famous physician, but only by the letter G. I take the note and let out a cry of surprise. How could I not recognise those slanted small letters Gonzalez's handwriting? Exactly as in that order. Now I understand the unexpected night rockets, broken wires, the appearance of junkers, over us in the hours of arrival at the front of the leaders of the Spanish people. I understand why Avila and Las Navas were not taken. The traitor Gonzalez directed us to Pegrinos, expecting us to find our doom there. He was wrong. That miserable spy and traitor. I read his note. In it, the spy is singing the praises of his masters. He promises a speedy victory for the rebels. He does not forget to remind in the next schedule for Junkers the day after tomorrow at eight in the morning. On that day, the Pejanaria will arrive at the front. Dot, 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 a few hours later we reach the headquarters of the Mangada Column. 
The spy under the guard of my fighters remained at the door. At the duty officer on duty at the headquarters, I urge a personal interview with the head of the column. Soon I hand the documents seized from the spy to a tall, thin old man. In a note addressed to Franco's headquarters, he recognises the handwriting of his closest aide and shakes our hands firmly. The next day, by order of the Republican government, Gonzalez was shot. Somewhere not far from our forward positions, and sometimes quite close by the temporary barracks, lone but always unexpected shots were heard. These were fired by Pat Kiko elusive Moroccan snipers. The rifles of these shooters were more frightening than a machine gun openly firing. We talked a lot and excitedly about the invisible supermetric Pacos, about the dead fighters. We felt some hypnotic fear of their powerful weapons. The name of these shooters, boldly sneaking almost into our rear, came from the exact reproduction of the sound of the bullet Paco flying out of the African rifle, which were armed with snipers. The Moroccans were definitely playing with us. Almost every day they plucked one or two casualties from our ranks. The mountainous terrain where we were located perfectly camouflaged the lone gunman. Rumours spread among the fighters about some mythical qualities of these pacos. It was said that they hit any bird in flight and hit the animal only in the eye so as not to spoil the hides. An unexpected shot rang out this morning. The bullet hit the window of our headquarters. We were stunned by the insolence of the enemy. In those days, Las Navas was already ours. Occupying this wonderful corner of Guadarrama, we soon realised that the enemy had lost not only a very important strategic point, but also a comfort unprecedented in war conditions. It was even offensive to prosaically refer to the beautiful hotels of Las Navas as barracks. Lucandi was right when he jokingly promised us a resort and rest here. In the mornings, our commander would tour the many hotels where we were quartered. He insisted on order and cleanliness and reminded us that soon we would be back here for a long time, as the Republic would give its soldiers a well-deserved vacation in the best resorts of Spain. Our Eastas Madurians, shocked by the extraordinary surroundings of the hotels abandoned by the noble idlers, would not consent to lie in bed for anything. They preferred to sleep on the floor, and only the insistence of Lucandi induced them to move into wide beds. Las Navas was a natural fortress protecting the approaches to Nivalparal. Our task was to guard this advantageous height and keep out the enemy, who was only five kilometres away. But the enemy daily reminded us of himself with single shots of Paco, as if trying to insinuate that he could do away with us with impunity. In those days we were already richer, and our ammunition supplies even allowed us to practice target shooting. We used our time at Las Navas for military and political training. Diego de Mesa went all out in classes with illiterate fighters, and soon he was showing Lucandi the first letters of his pupils. Popeye is our reader and front-line book-bearer, covered the whole battalion with his educational work. And Julio Romeo was completing a course of lectures on sanitation, hygiene and first aid in battle. But this quiet army life was not to our liking. We had already become accustomed to fighting, and even the honourable task of defending Las Navas was considered less important than the constant advances and skirmishes with the Moroccans. Lucandi guessed our moods, and we were severely harassed for these, as he put it, political strategic lags. One day the captain summoned Del Bull, Pancha Video, Popeyes, Figueroas, myself and three other men. Lucandi was serious about organising a sniper team. He chose us. The commander unfolded a fascinating picture of our eight men's activities. This night we were to make our first foray into enemy territory. At dawn we must return to report on our progress. I thought you said, turn to me, Lucandi, that you are familiar with these places. What a memory our grouse has. I had once told you about my wanderings through Guadarrama with my faculty friends. Lucandi remembered that and has now put me in the eight as a guide. At night we leave Las Navas to exercise as Lucandi puts it. Five kilometres from us, in a small village, stands a fascist battalion. 
it's a mixed unit of Moroccans and Phalangists. According to intelligence, the enemy is waiting for reinforcements. Crawling in dark clothes, we creep to the target. The night is moonless, dark a faithful assistant of the scout. Tonight our weapon of choice will be a blanket. A tall moor steps from tree to tree. The Moroccan is distinguished by his white robe. Obviously there's nothing easier to kill him with a bullet. But that's not why we came here. We need to take out all the sentries quietly. Panchavideo, Delbol and one of the men crawl up to the Moroccan, and as he makes a turn, they pounce on him, cover him with a blanket, and throw him to the ground. He has no time even to scream. The next moor, 200 metres away, gets me Pepe and Figueroyce. While the first three of us are dealing with the huge moor, we wait for the right moment and then pounce on the second sentry. In this way we crawled for about a kilometre, removing all the sentries' six men guarding the village. It gets light very early on Guadarama, and we must get back to our place by daylight. Another hour is at our disposal. We decide to enter the village and find the headquarters. We want to surprise Lukandi and bring him some documents from the enemy headquarters, but after a few minutes of wandering, prudence takes over and we decide to go back. On a narrow street, Delbal stumbles over some metal object. Wonderful, he whispers, rubbing his bruised leg. It's a portable mortar, very handy and indispensable in the mountains. You can even run with it, it's so light. We have one of these in Las Navas. But we haven't worked with it for a long time, we don't have any mortar shells left. Delbal fumbles on the ground and almost shrieks with delight. A whole stockpile of mortar shells. They're shaped like airplane shells. With the mortar on Popeye's shoulder and loaded with shells, we silently make our way out of the village. When we are about 400 metres from the village, a plan to sow panic in the ranks of the enemy is hatched. Quickly the mortar is mounted, it does not take much time, and the first deafening shot awakens the sleeping hamlet. Instantly we move the mortar a hundred yards to the side and send in the second and third shells. Thus, within a few minutes we change firing positions, it is difficult to imagine what is done in the camp of the enemy. It is almost impossible to determine from where the destroying shells of mortars are flying, disabling up to thirty men on a successful hit. To the sleepy enemy, who is firing indiscriminately, it must seem that he is surrounded on all sides. We hear a completely incomprehensible firefight in the village territory. The Nazis in the dark mistake each other for enemies. That's what we need. Not having used up even a tenth of our stock of mortar shells, we quickly withdraw and soon, before full dawn, we knock on Felice Lucandi's door. We set up the mortar in the middle of the room, lay out the shells, and Delbal reports the first sortie of the Republican Pacos. How happy Lucandi is. He mutters something, hugs each of us, and finally speaks. If they are Pacos, then we must be called what they call the best shooters in the Soviet Union. We proclaim Hara and accept the initiation into Voroshilov shooters. This name is assigned to us. From now on our eight are called Voroshilov's shooters. We often make distant reconnaissance to the rear of the enemy, and our weapons are no longer blankets, but rifles with telescopic sights which hit even more accurately than African guns. For three weeks we have been standing still. Las Navas is almost peaceful. But soon the 4th Battalion, as at Nevalparal, begins company by company duty in the forward positions. The enemy, too, has abandoned his village. The Republican and Fascist trenches are separated by 500 metres, we haven't gotten food for a week. The field is strewn with empty tin cans. Yesterday we cursed these sardines, our only inviolable reserve, which we eat for the third day. Today we are already making forays for cans thrown out of the trenches. There is not a single can of canned food or crumb of bread in Las Navas or in the trenches. The hunters for the empty cans return by crawling. The enemy in the vicinity must not know that we are tightening our bellies with our belts. A rich catch punch of video announces cheerfully, climbing into the trench, and he shows, dancing, the contents of two cans. 
It's good to be full, Julian Palacios says philosophically. If yesterday we were as hungry as we are today, there wouldn't be a single sardine tail left in these boxes, but as it is, we have four untouched fish. Yes, that's an accurate count. There are four sardines found in the three cans. Francisco, quoting Horace, pronounces profoundly, Time is running out, and I propose to extend wisdom for a day. We guess what lies behind the words of the fat Francisco. You feel good, camel? You got drunk in Madrid and are now eating fatty deposits like your too humped counterpart. Francisco mumbles guiltily. Honestly, I'm not going to ask you for a quarter of a sardine, but if I were you, I'd eat exactly half of it so I can find two sardines in those cans again tomorrow. We laugh and generously offer him half a sardine. The feast is in full swing. Panchavidya reveals to us his exceptional culinary knowledge. There are dreams and there is reality, he begins in the calm voice of a storyteller preparing for a long narrative. You may dream of puff pastries filled with cock's comb. This is a dream of a sweet tooth. The fighters of the Republic must see only the real thing. With a broad gesture, Panchavidio points to the field behind the trenches. Here are potatoes, ordinary potatoes, a side dish that grows under our noses. You know, says Pancho with sudden haste, that these fruits can be used to make 12 different dishes. We swallow our saliva and listen to Pancho Video's fabulous menu. He lists. Mashed potatoes, jacket potatoes, charcoal roasted, fried. But where to get the oil? Popeye asks timidly. Butter? Pancho Video scornfully cuts him off you wretched ignoramus, and he makes a stunning discovery the glory of Las Navas potatoes is that they are fried in their own juice. I can hear my stomach rumbling at this news. What we would give for one potato like that? But the worm of doubt gnaws at us, and we call Figueros, a peasant fighter known in the battalion as the sheriff for advice. He knows everything, especially in the field of agriculture. Figaro confirms with a look of connoisseurship that Las Navas potatoes are really good. But where are you, fellow students? He says politely. If the captain had allowed us, we would have brought a whole ton. Diego de Mesa is offended for the entire student body and almost angry. What do you mean? If it wasn't for the shelling, the students would have been digging for the whole battalion long ago. Sheriff, he shakes his head in pretended laughter. You would have dug? You'd have to know how. God damn it, we are offended in our better senses. A delegation to Lukandi is being dispatched immediately. We ask for permission to send a small food party to dig potatoes. We prove all the safety of such an expedition first. The enemy has not eaten longer than ours. He has not even the remnants of sardines and therefore no strength to shoot. I agree, says Lucandi, and, discussing all the precautions, approves the composition of the fighter gardeners. A total of 14 people will go seven peasants and seven students. The peasants are led by Figaro, the students by Julian Palacios. We're making a friendly wager. Whoever digs fewer potatoes feeds the winning brigade a wonderful lunch in Las Navas on our first day of vacation,